on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. There's always been this funny tension for both publishers and authors with one eye on the business and one eye on the art. And I guess there's just this long-standing artistic attitude that you can't sully yourself too much with those business concerns because it demeans the art in some way, which I think is silly. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show on a Friday with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson, and my hay fever. So if uh, I'm going to sound really dreadful... Um, in, in the, today's episode so apologies for that hopefully you can still understand me but it is it's pollen central in Salisbury at the moment and I'm really suffering you've really suffered this year I've noticed it's um, not mm. fun I don't think I've been touch whatever this desk is made of I've never had hay fever I think it can come on at any point can't it but I haven't had it but... no it's I've had, well, I had it when I was a kid quite badly but um, right. normally um, not too bad but at the moment as I said to you just a moment ago this is a great big field over there to my left that the farmer is growing so he can uh, cut some silage and it's just kind of it's huge so i'm just looking at that and thinking there's a lot of pollen there i think and it's drifting mm. this way into my nose so yes there we go You're- so apologies to everyone if if i'm uh, a little bit bunged up today in the youtube comments and comments generally you're now going to get lots of um suggestions this as always happens when you mention an ailment people say this is what you need to do drink well a lime funny. tea upside down yeah people have become very in, in- a very expert expert in all kinds of things. So I had, um, I think in my newsletter a month or two ago, I mentioned that I had the vaccine. Yeah. I had more than one person telling me that um, keys were now magnetically attached to my forehead. And yeah. <laughs> I keep checking my um, my 5G signal on my phone, but it's exactly the same as it was before I had the yeah. vaccine. So I don't really understand. Now, we had a YouTube comment as well this week from um, somebody who said, why did Lucy score feel the need to mention a vaccine? This is a very dangerous unproven thing that's costing lives around the world so i i'm afraid i said uh vaccine uh, that lucy you me and others on sbf are very pleased and proud to have had our vaccine and we are very strongly encouraging everyone else to have it and her view is narrow and potentially could cost millions of lives i didn't mince my words no i think that's reasonable (laughs) Uh, i didn't want to get into a discussion and i did delete the conspiratorial youtube video she then posted in reply right okay we don't need time for that but yes uh, we are mainstream in terms of vaccines and uh, although if somebody does have a magic hay fever cure of course and i have already mentioned i occasionally use a steroid spray for an allergy i get i i'm allergic to alcohol Oh my God, that's awful. I know, it's like the worst allergy you can have. It makes me very bunged up. If I don't have the steroid spray, that enables me to drink (laughs) to my my full capacity, which is where I need to be. We can't be writers without drinking, right? Can you or can you? Actually, that's a bit unfair to people who can't drink anymore. Yes, I I think you you don't need to be a writer. You don't need to drink to be a writer. No, absolutely. (laughs) Um, Okay, let's have a little chat just about paid ads uh, because I've been having some interesting experiences since I've been running my own books as well as Fuse and as well as talking to you about your books, Mark. Um, uh, As you know, that's the core business that we do here at SBF. And uh, we've had a few people asking about how many books you need to be profitable. And I am actually making a profit on one book at the moment. Now, it might be that my book has... Um, is, is a very genre specific book and I found an, a niche audience but that's I think what you can do with paid ads and I'm using Facebook ads so I, I think I suggested to you I, I, I told you that I was making a small loss every day sometimes five or six seven dollars uh, a day which I didn't want to be losing that much but then I did some analysis and worked out that the US was costing me money and the UK looked like it was profitable so I cut the US ads out and obviously those sales went down, but actually, yes, lo and behold, I was uh, making a profit just or breaking or just um, going into negative, but overall just slightly in profit in the UK. I also said to you that I was suspicious about my video ads campaign. So I have a nice video ad. I think you've seen, I think it might have been served to you in the world. It looks good. It's um, uh, well put together by John Stone and it does really well on the Facebook ads dashboard. In fact, it gets me 9p clicks over the last month lots of them for not much money. Um, My suspicion was it wasn't pushing books. It wasn't actually selling books. So I don't have affiliate an affiliate account, unfortunately, to do a sort of detailed tracking, which you'd need to do. 
So what I did is on Sunday, I turned it off and I just left my interests ad running, which I think targets Tom Clancy and a couple of other um, uh, similar authors. And lo and behold, I've made on average £4.33 a day since then. So that, that video ad was not was performing on the Facebook ads dashboard, but not performing in terms of sales. And I think this is a, a key message when we're looking at metrics. We do talk about cost per click and click through rate and all these things, but there's only one metric that really matters um, in the end, uh, and that is sales. Yeah, it's always as if I've heard that before somewhere. I don't know. Maybe that's something that I've banged on about quite a lot. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you need to. The the other metrics are interesting and they can be useful as kind of health checks as to what, whether an ad is doing what you want it to do. But the most important thing is, as I think I said on the webinar the other night, it's it's just um, looking at the at the return. How much money is it making? It doesn't matter if you're getting. Um, it comes to terrible maths. If you if you get a five cents per click on a video ad and your image ads are twenty cents per click, your um, uh, perhaps your your video ad is only converting one in 10, but your image ad is converting three in 10. It's, I think if I sat down and worked it out, that would probably demonstrate that the image ad is making you more money, even though it's more expensive uh, than the video ad. So you just need to you know, be aware that there will be some variances in there and, and see if you can cut through and find out what the answer is, as, as you've done. Yeah, and the, obviously I've got one book, so it's not complicated by read through. Uh, read through we talk about it does complicate things you can expect to see a loss on your dashboard in fact in many cases you will see a loss on your dashboard for book one but if you've then got four or five books behind it or even two or three books behind it that's where the profit can come so you certainly need to take that into account mine's not com complicated by read through um, so it's just one book. Obviously, you can expect to see a loss with book one if you've got a series. Even if it's just two or three books behind it, you might well see a loss on book one, but you will get a profit down the line with that. So, um, but nonetheless, it is sales. It is, it is, you know, that's what you've got to keep your eye on, not getting carried away with some of the other metrics. And so I'm making $6 a day. I just worked out, I've just converted it for our American friends, which is $2,200 a year from one book, which pays for a bill or two or you know um, more than just a bill uh, which is a great start for me and the only thing I really want to do at this stage is break even but build an audience building and keep me motivated while I'm writing book two. Now there's two things I'd say about that I mean, first of all it is two thousand dollars is is not small change by any means um, and we, as I mentioned again in the webinar for the course now which is now closed I think probably has has closed um, the the ads for author scores you can have it for one dollar forty five cents per day. So if you're making six dollars a day, or even if it's just one book, also you make more if you've got more books. Then that's something you know you've done very well. It's not easy to do that, but that just goes to show that it's possible to profit quite quickly. Um, and as you said, the the main thing for you is not really the money here. It's you're building an audience who'll be looking for um, for book two. So what's your mailing list growth like at the moment? Yeah, I haven't checked it in the last few days, but I've been doing, I mean, these are small numbers of books I'm selling a day and page read, so uh, the numbers aren't very high, but yeah, I haven't checked it for a while, but it was building by two or three a day. I yeah, think, well, that's good. So heard. obviously that's fantastic. So maybe you've got a thousand extra readers by the time you launch the next one, although that'll be in 10 years. So maybe you've got 10,000 readers by the time you launch the next one. Rude. And then, truthful, uh, and then um, you'll be ready to go. You know, it's, you'll have a much bigger audience ready to, to buy the next book. James is looking. James is looking well, at his because uh, I had a, I had fifteen new subscribers on June the seventeenth, which is a big day. So yes, yeah, so it looks like actually it may have gone up to maybe average four a day now, six two pretty, days ago. For one book, that's excellent. Yeah, so that's really really good. And I you're do not have... doing. Are you running any kind of lead generation campaigns no. or just? Well, that's fantastic. So they're even they they're the best kind of subscribers. Yeah, that's really really good. The book. Mm. Uh, I think I do have quite a high conversion rate, and I did steal this idea off you where you did your. Um, redacted personnel you steal file. everything off me but I do, that's, all, of that's okay that's, that's kind of, how this works that's how it works no and you've you've actually done a better job than i have your your the the um stuff you've offered at the back is very 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 um connected to the book and yeah. interesting and I, I would probably download that and i'm pretty jaded with yeah. to these things so yeah it's it's really good I think it has quite a um, yeah high, uh, high conversion rate. Good. Well, look, this is going out. Let me just say, for those of you who are, you know, I suddenly thought, well, maybe I should uh, look into this course. This is going out on Friday, the 2nd of July. In actual fact, the course officially, unofficially, 
closes at the end of Sunday on the 4th. And the reason we say that, we actually close it on the 30th of June. That's the big advertised public date. But for technical reasons, we don't actually close it until Sunday night just because there's always people whose transactions don't go through for a couple of days. So if you did go to selfpublishingforum.com forward slash ads for authors, you might get lucky before Sunday night. And then that's it, probably till 2022. when we'll open ads for again. Um, we're going to be working on the new modules and stuff in between, of course. TikTok ads for authors, that's what I'm thinking about. He's saying we might add. I, I, yeah. Britt Brit Andrews, I think it's Britt Andrews, the foundation winner who we're going to interview soon. She's... Um, Without going into too much detail, because I think it's something we would like to kind of release in the in the podcast that we do. She's gone from making not much pennies really, um, bef- like eight months ago, to making mid five figures um, this month. I think she's on for, and that's all down to advertising. And she um, she's told Lucy, who's been talking to her, that one of the things that she's done really well uh, is TikTok advertising. So. That's on my radar, I, and I'm, I have to say I may not be, well, I won't be the person to teach that because I've never, I don't have the TikTok app. I've, I'm not really into that, and I don't really think, I may be wrong, but I don't think that that's a, the place that my readers would hang out. Kind of uh, thriller readers. What's her genre? Romance. Yeah, I love TikTok. Well, you love romance, so you know you're I, you're, I love you're perfect. I am. Um, I don't read romance books generally uh, unless they're friends. I do watch TikTok and I actually have to limit myself. It's like late end of night. If you're not careful, 45 minutes can turn into two hours on TikTok. But um, I, like you, looked at it in a bit the same way we looked at Instagram and thought that you can make nice ads and make them look pretty, but it'll only be a few genres that specifically well, dovetail. I don't know audience. that that's true. I've heard more than more than just Brit now has said that, that TikTok ads are really working well the reason for that might be is that people like us and you know i'm a fairly you know i like to test things and i'm quite new to an early adopter when it comes to new platforms and things even i haven't thought about it yet so there's probably Mm. not much competition um, in terms of clicks so we need to when i say we need to look at it that's one for you probably to have a little look at and we'll see if we can find someone who who might be able to um to, to put something together for us I shall very happily put some SPF investment money in the way of the final flight and see if it flies yeah, on TikTok. Yeah, could do. Yeah. Um, we'll have a look at that. Um, of course, we're now going to get lots of emails from people saying it's the Chinese. You're going to give everything away to the Chinese. But they, well, they, you know. there's nothing the Chinese don't know about me. I'm all mm. over TikTok. So they're, they're, and I'm happy to share. Good. Okay. Look, um, that's a little chat about paid ads. Please don't say the waffle goes on because we're talking about what we're supposed to be talking about. They can say what they want. Enjoy that. They can say what they want. But the interview today is with a very high-profile person in the publishing space called Jane Friedman. Uh, she has a newsletter, actually a paid newsletter, which is an interesting uh, way of doing things. I think you and I both subscribe to it. She has a, a her thing is to keep her finger on the pulse and let us know what's happening. But unlike lots of people who are more in the traditional industry than they are indie, she's not even not even close to sniffy about the indie world. She loves it and she thinks it's a really exciting thing. And she thinks lots of people in the traditional industry have just got blinkers on when it comes to the changes that are that are happening in her head. And I love that. It's refreshing to hear from somebody who, as I say, really does come from the traditional background. She has a huge following on social media, which she talks a little bit about uh, in this interview as well. But generally what we hear is we're testing the uh, the temperature of the uh, of the publishing industry at the moment, and I think it's going to be uh, a useful thing for us to all listen to. Here's Jane. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Jane Friedman, welcome to the self publishing show. Very nice to have you with us. Um, a very clear picture, I have to say. You're somewhere in the states, I'm guessing. I am. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm jealous of the quality of that picture. This is a nerdy thing, but is that a really good webcam? You've got some kind of a super webcam? I have a, uh, a digital SLR that I've hooked <gasps> up to my computer. You've got an SLR working as a live streaming device. I've never been able to do that. We're going to yeah, have to talk. A- this is really not interesting to anybody listening apart from me and one or two <laughs> other people who do podcasts, but that's, that's something I'm going to have to pick your brains about. Yeah, well, Canon came out with a bunch of uh, utilities. So if you have an old Canon lying around, uh, you could probably hook it up to your computer. I do have an old Canon lying around. I've got a 5D somewhere. Okay, well, anyway, that's a non-publishing thing to start with, except in this (laughs) modern world, a lot of authors 
do a lot of video, so it may be of interest. But anyway, let's talk to uh, let's talk to you about you for a bit, uh, Jane. If that's okay, why don't you start off with a sort of potted history of how you've got to where you are today? I started in traditional publishing, and I went into it right out of college. I even had an internship while I was in college. So I'm a lifer at this point. I have no intention of leaving the industry uh, going on 25 years now. So I entered uh, traditional publishing in the late 90s. It was still very much a print business. Obviously, there was the internet, but no one was really thinking about it uh, all that much. So I spent about 12 years uh, at the same house. It was a Midwestern company. It wasn't one of the big New York houses, but it was still a sizable house. I would say it was maybe, if you're just counting in terms of sales, maybe the 15th biggest publisher in the US. So after I left that, I went into teaching. I went back into publishing for a while on the more literary end of the spectrum. And then I went full-time freelance in 2014. And a lot of people know me for my time at Writer's Digest. Uh, so I, I have a what I would consider a 360 view of the industry. I look at traditional, I look at self, I look at the more literary, I look at the more commercial. So I like to serve as a bridge between all of those communities. Yeah, and I think you do that very well. Um, just on the on, on the bits that you were doing in traditional media at that time, um, the ebook revolution came along. Did they grasp it? Have they grasped it to today? <laughs> it certainly wasn't uh, grasped at the time. Um, interestingly, though, you know there were a few people who definitely saw and tried to talk about it, tried to start businesses around it. Some succeeded, some didn't. One in particular, I'll mention Richard Curtis, a literary agent. Uh, he, we actually did a book with him at Writer's Digest about how to publish eBooks. I think that came out in like the year 2000, 2001, long before the Kindle when wow. you still had, what was it, the Rocket Reader? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. And, you know, that was when Stephen King did his singles and everyone was like, oh, is, is Stephen King going to leave his publisher and just do, you know, make millions on his ebook singles? And that quickly, you know, disappeared. So, yeah, there, there was that first wave where there was actually a lot of excitement in traditional publishing. And then it totally went away because, well, we didn't have the Kindle. Hmm. Um, so even when then when the Kindle did come, I think there was just a lot of... Um, what like oh here we go again mm. <laughs> uh there are a lot of people who just thought nah this this isn't going to go anywhere and is it is it that is that the predominant thought or is there a feeling of of not wanting it to be successful because it disrupts a model that hasn't changed in in a long time yeah i think i think the latter but i mean uh, as of today though publishers i mean they clearly see that you know, for most commercial fiction, half the sales are digital. That's putting audio into the mix, of course. But now everyone's very focused on digital audio because of the higher price point and the really nice profits. And eBooks have been declining in sales until the pandemic uh, when they started going back up. But part of that is traditional publishing depressing that market quite intentionally, uh, partly to preserve bookstores, print sales, which are profitable to not put too much power into Amazon's hands, which is understandable. So yeah, there's there's still a real tension there. Yeah. And that's very visible. You talk about depression. I mean, I read, um, I, I subscribe to KU and try to read to make get my money's worth, but end up going to books that simply aren't enrolled, particularly military history books, very traditionally yeah. published books that I quite like. And it's frustrating for me to see a price point of Eleven pounds ninety nine for the ebook and seven ninety nine for the paperback, but that's yeah. a deliberate strategy, right? From the trads. Oh yeah, that's very deliberate. Um, although I don't, I think in the end it may. I, I'm not on the inside looking at their P and Ls, but I think it just it still puts more power in the hands of Amazon because they're the ones who are selling more of uh, print books alongside the digital. So it's just strengthened their hand anyway. Um, but publishers do. I guess, get to hold on to that print market um, for what it's worth. Yeah. And is that because the physical product, because they have these lines of economy, they obviously print in bulk and right. the, the markup there is just simply more than they're going to make on the ebook side? Is but definitely for hardcovers. Hardcovers are pretty lucrative. Uh, once you get into the paperback, I think, you know, it's it, there are a lot of variables. Okay. Um, and then you also get into 
the effects of the third party market, used books, um, all of the third party sellers on Amazon, because you know there are lots of people who can cut, undercut the the new retail price. Um, so they, yeah, it's but still at the end of the day, they they like selling their print. Yeah, they certainly do. And I suppose that's still the area that they dominate. You walk into bookshops in, I'm sure it's the same in the States, certainly in the UK, starting to see LJ Ross and Mark Dawson, my colleague here on the show, I start to notice their books in in the bookshops. But by and large, I would still say 90% plus are traditionally published books. That still yeah. is a difficult place. You know, I've just published my first book and my friends will say, well, can I see it? I haven't seen it in the shops yet. And I still have to say, well you probably aren't going to see it in the shops. That's still a yeah. traditional area, isn't it? It is very much so. And it's very much the New York publishing area. At least, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but at least at like your average Barnes and Noble, at least until recently, we'll see what James Daunt does with it. Um, but, you know, 80% of what's stocked is from the big New York houses, the conglomerates. They're not necessarily from smaller independent presses. So it's a very particular type of book that tends to make its way there, although that that may have to change. We'll see. Yeah. And what what's your take on it really, Jane? Because I, some people with your background, quite traditional, I still sense from some of the things they say publicly are, are still sort of wanting the old days to be the case and a little bit dismissive of the indie world. But you're not like that. I think you're you're quite enthusiastic about the indie side of life. I am very much so. And and maybe part of it, I was influenced early on by being assigned when I started with Writer's Digest, I was assigned to the self-publishing beat. And so I saw some of the earliest success stories there and, and the people who were doing some pretty amazing things uh, in the in the 2000s before the Kindle came onto the scene. And I just saw it as, you know, a, a lot of rebels and rule breakers and um, uh, progressive technically savvy folks. And it was exciting to be around. And I think it's it's always been an area of, of opportunity for authors, a way to uh, reach your readers directly, do things that the publishers uh, just, you know, don't, they're not necessarily risk takers for the most part. So yeah. I think there's just a lot of room for experimentation. Well, of course, they do so few books. I mean, that's been the big thing. It's it's put a lot of power on their side of things of selecting who's going to be published. And that's that's the interesting thing for me that's changed because it was like winning the lottery to get a publishing contract. And now I can publish a book and my friends are all reading my book. And that's that's quite a seismic change. That's That takes that power away. Um, so you can see why the traditional industry is resistant to that fundamental change because that changes their role. It does. It's harder for them to play the gatekeeper, curator, tastemaker. Uh, it's and, and it turns them more into let's just take this author who's already succeeding and make them even bigger than before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is what is happening, of course, from, from time to time with, uh, with indie authors getting quite nice contracts. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder what impact it has on them in the houses. I know you're outside of that system now, but there's been an explosion of genre fiction, of subgenre fiction, of fantasy and lit RPG and all these things and reverse horror trends and things that didn't have the space to grow and breathe with the few books that were published traditionally. Indie has, has changed readers' habits a little bit, or readers have changed writers' habits, maybe. That's the way around. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know... The publisher that I worked at, while they it was primarily a nonfiction publisher and, and there was interest in series and there was a lot of profitability in certain types of nonfiction series. What one of the big things I've seen change though is with fiction is how series driven it's become in, become in some of the genre fiction areas where it I don't know, it just feels like it was unheard of to do like a, a 10, 15, 20 book series with spin-off series. And that's that's very interesting to me. And maybe it's also a little bit cultural or trend driven because of our binge activity in other areas of the medium what media and wanting things to continue um, and live in that story world longer and longer yeah so there's the odd exception like ian fleming's james bond series but most of those other his contemporaries ian fleming's people like alistair mclean i think they just all wrote standalone novels didn't they their, their next novel would be you didn't have to read anything in order but that's not the way I, indies tend to write correct 
right? Yeah. And, and especially for the literary MFA leaning publishing crowd series is just it's so standalone driven. And I, I'm still waiting to see if and how that changes. Yeah. So, Jane, you said you went freelance from after Reader's Digest. Um, what uh, what services were you offering? What was your freelance role? So when I started freelancing, it, it was a mix of consulting, teaching and speaking, uh, editing clients, helping a lot of folks with their queries and proposals, trying to get them traditionally published. Um, and then, but more recently, I've shifted away from consulting and editing and more towards doing a, a paid newsletter. So it's an industry analysis newsletter, comes out every two weeks. And then I'm also leaning heavily on teaching, especially during the pandemic, that was very good for online teaching. And so I host different instructors throughout the year on various topics. I also teach myself. So that's, I'm trying to get uh, away from selling my time yes. <laughs> for money yeah. and more into, into writing and, and longer term activities. Yeah, there's only so much of your time as a finite resource. Um, I hadn't realized you had a paid newsletter because I get all your stuff for free on social media, but there's a paid, obviously more instructional, more thorough version of that. Yeah, it's very trends oriented. It's kind of like, you know, the the investment newsletters of your uh, where mm. you're getting kind of the inside track on what's happening. It's it's for all authors. So I cover traditional and independent equally, um, although I find that more self-published authors are inclined to subscribe, um, which probably says something about the average traditional <laughs> published author. They just want more to be taken care of and let someone else worry about the business bits. Yeah, the business side is certainly... I think deliberately kept at arm's length from authors. They don't yeah, really they don't really want to have discussions about unit shifts and profit lines. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think that it's too bad because I think treating authors as if at least publishers if they treat authors as if they can't handle it and it's it just encourages um I don't know uh, childishness really when it when when addressing yeah. the business side. But it's also a lack of I uh, I find it odd, you know, occasionally you see discussions. Uh, I had, I saw one last year, I think, Drew say Mitchell was on, on a culture show here in the UK, sitting next to a traditionally published author, and she's an indie, very successful indie. And the traditional author did that thing where he was slightly bristling at the dis business discussion that Drew was talking about. So he, he said that classic thing is, it's not about the money for me. And I, I thought about this afterwards, I was thinking, but it, the money is being made. When you say it's not about the money, someone's making the money from your books. You sell a lot of books. So what you're basically saying is you don't really want the money. I mean, that's fine, by the way. That's a completely legitimate position to be in. I want to write. I'm very happy with the income I get. I'm free to do this. But to pretend it's not about the money when the publishing business is a business, it's just a decision you've made is that they can do right. that and take the money. Yeah, there's always been this funny tension uh, for both publishers and authors with one eye on the business and one eye on the art. And I guess there's just this longstanding artistic attitude that you can't sully yourself too much with those business concerns because it demeans the art in some way, which I think is silly. Yeah. Let's talk about business a little bit. So your view at the moment, uh, particularly in the indie world, Jane, do you see some common mistakes people are being are making? Or do you think indies are getting the business side of it right generally? I think they're getting it right. I think they're very flexible, nimble. They pay, they're very market focused, uh, maybe sometimes too much. So um, uh, it's, I think traditional publishing has a lot to learn from how nimble and flexible it is. I often encounter authors who are just entering into the system. Maybe they got one book or maybe two at most, and they're expecting success too soon. Or they're expecting they can just do this thing that they want to do and the readers will come without thinking about packaging and positioning and their competition. So there's a, there are a lot of folks new who are self-publishing and they're just not thinking like a publisher yet. They're still thinking like an artiste um, and that they're going to break the mold of their genre. And I say, well, I, you know, that's going to be challenging for you starting out. Um, and you shouldn't expect to gain momentum quickly if you're trying to break all the rules as you begin. Yes. That's interesting. I mean, I, I completely agree. That is that is something. And having just published my first book, but I'm steeped inside the indie mindset and the business mindset because of my position here. So I think I do have my eyes open to this. And 
I started to think recently, um, you know, my friends who aren't in publishing saying, are you making money from your book yet? And I think of it almost like an old business method where book one is probably going to lose you money. Book yeah. two, you might break even. Book three is the time where you should start being able to turn a profit by investing in book one. And, um, yeah. and that's how most businesses start. So why would it be different starting? And the reason it feels different is because you spend 10 years of your life, whatever it's been, writing this big book, which is huge and drains you emotionally and then publishes it. And it's quite hard to think, well, I'll probably watch this lose money every day whilst I'm writing book two. But that is a that is a mindset. Yes, I, you're absolutely correct. And people really struggle with that. And they often drop out of the game at that point when they're, I can't spend another 10 years writing and publishing something that doesn't sell. Yeah. <laughs> but they just haven't, they haven't given it enough time. And also you can't spend 10 years writing a book. No, you can't. And that was my first book, to be fair. And uh, I didn't spend all yeah. 10 years writing it, but next right. one will be quicker. I'm all, 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 almost through it. Now you're writing, Jane. What are you writing at the minute? Uh, almost all of my writing is business related. So my, th- I like to say it's not such a secret anymore, but I don't particularly like writing books. I like really fast paced, high churn sort of writing. So newsletters and blogging, that, that's great for me. I love installments. Yeah. Uh, so you, you've never, I mean, nonfiction is more your background, both traditional and yeah. now, but you've never been tempted to have a go at fiction. You haven't got that novel in you that everyone says they've got. <sighs> absolutely not <laughs> no. that's uh, that's interesting um now in terms of the work you do with authors now are you working mainly i mean i know you're trying to shift away from your time um very understandably is it is it still mainly indies as you were alluding to just then or are you working traditionally published authors and if you are what mm-hmm. what conversations take place with them yeah, it's an equal mix of traditionally published authors and indies. Um, so with traditionally published authors, it's often work on book proposals or queries or you know trying to get that uh, trying to get that yes from an agent or a publisher. With self-publishing authors, it's often troubleshooting about why something isn't working or why am I stalling out? Or sometimes I get people really early in the process where they're trying to make decisions about, how to get that first book on the market. Should What sort of help should they hire? Do they want to do it entirely themselves? Do they want to go with a so-called hybrid, which you know, has some issues associated with it? So people are really super confused by the options out there and they just don't know what's worth the money. So I'm there to kind of cut through all of that and guide them. And is your plan to turn that into sort of online courses and webinars and so on rather than one-to-one? And frankly, I'm, I'm trying not to do any of that aside from basically speaking engagements and, and, and webinars. I'm not really into the passive income side of this, which I know many people are interested in, but I, I just, it's not interesting to me to do long-term online courses. I just really like the live interactive engagement, short bursts, and then move on to something else. Yeah. There's kind of a pattern here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now, talking of short bursts, you, you've you got a big following on social media, Twitter in particular. How did that mm-hmm. come about? Was that a deliberate strategy of yours? Uh, that was a bit of strategy and a whole lot of luck. So I got on Twitter early on in 2008 or so, dabbled a little bit, left, came back uh, around 2009 and decided you know, maybe I should try to make sense of this for other people because there was a lot of interest, but not a, it was hard to find the substance. It was just, it wasn't it, Twitter in 2009 was not the Twitter of 2021 or even the Twitter of 2016. Um, so at the time I rounded up interesting information that was being shared there, links, stories, articles that were helpful to writers. And I did a weekly column called Best Tweets for Writers, which was really not so much about Twitter as about what I found on Twitter. And so I did that religiously for a couple of years. And because of that, I had lots of people linking to my Twitter account, lots of people tweeting that column, lots of followers as a result of the column. Now I didn't, I wanted to like grow a, a Twitter base, uh, and that's one of the reasons I did this column. But what happened as a result, not just the added attention of doing this list, but Twitter itself saw the activity and put me on its recommended list for the books community generally. And that's when my following just 
astronomically increased. And then as soon as they took me off, it like actually achieved more normal human <laughs> proportions. So that's, that's what did it. Um, my Twitter following today is really much bigger than what I actually am in real life. So people have this kind of distorted view of like how popular I am. How many followers do you have now? Uh, I think it's uh, 215,000. Quarter of a million. That's great. Yeah. Um, and how much work does it take to keep servicing that account? It's, you know, it pretty much runs itself at this point. There's certainly a lot of um, check-in that I do to keep up with any replies or, or, or people engaging with me. I am very much interested in those conversations but I don't have as much time for instigating conversations as I would like. And that's where I think the real value comes is in throwing out questions or doing threads. Um, but oftentimes I'm just, I have other work to do and I not all day to spend on Twitter. Yeah, it's definitely, it's an interactive medium, isn't it? And I see um, uh, the accounts that start right from the beginning with almost zero interactivity or the ones worse than that, they start something, but then they never reply or respond to anyone. Right. I think you're not really getting that right. I think, but your account right. does seem to be quite a lively interactive account, but maybe I'm just catching those moments when you're there live. And yeah. I can imagine, I can imagine also it, not only a time suck, we know social media can be a time suck, um, quite a diversion for you as well when you've got that sizable yeah. entity that a Twitter account is. Yeah, it's for me, it's like having the radio on in the background. You know, I've always I use TweetDeck and I've always got it kind of minimized and I pop it open. I don't know, every hour or so or if I'm feeling bored or I want to procrastinate, I just pop that open and say, what are people talking about? Do I have something to add? Um, but unfortunately, you know, it, it has become a, a very politically charged platform, which scares some people. Fortunately, I've been on it long enough now that I know where the landmines are. Yeah. Um, so that helps. It's hard to suggest that people do anything like what I did because Twitter was a different place then. Yeah, yeah it can be quite negative and uh, toxic on occasions, Twitter, that's for sure. Um, okay, Jane, so where are we going next? Where do you think, I mean, how do you think things are going to shape up in the future? The traditional industry going to find a way of, of the ebook being a central yeah. part of its offering or are they going to continue to resist it? Oh, I think the really big decision point or a pressure point for traditional publishers is the subscription service, uh, which relates to eBooks, but also audiobooks. So I'm really fascinated by the difference in business models that where, where we see in Europe, something like Storytel, where it's an all you can listen or consume service and they pay based on consumption, kind of similar to Kindle Unlimited uh, in, in the US. So you've got the storytell model, which is very different, I, at least I think in, in theory, from the audible model, which is you can't just listen to everything you want. It's a credit system, although we know the returns issue kind of throws that mm. <laughs> into some doubt. Uh, but still, publishers are making what I would consider a la carte sales sort of money and profits off of audible, which is really dominant in the US and I believe in the UK as well. So I, you know, consumers are getting more accustomed to subscription services where you're not limited in how much you can consume. We've got Scribd in the US that has grown because of the pandemic. In fact, all the subscription services have grown because of the pandemic. So how long will publishers be able to, at least the US publishers have really kept their titles, audio in particular, out of these subscription services. They put their backlist eBooks into things like Scribd. They've stayed out of Kindle Unlimited. How long can they do that? Um, and I, I just feel like part of it's a missed opportunity. Like they're probably not experimenting enough. Um, and then part of it probably is a threat to, the, to their profits. Um, so that's what I'm, that's the biggest thing that I'm looking at on a monthly basis. Yeah, I mean, they are coalescing a bit, the big trad. So you are, I mean, how, how many are there now? Four, whatever. It, it, I can't really keep count of what, how you define them. Um, but any kind of joint venture between them, if they decided to pull from Amazon and have a joint venture, an alternative um, subscription service, mm -hmm. that would be a big chunk of the world's books. But yeah. could you ever see them doing anything that, that radical? I feel like it's inevitable. Like if Penguin Random House does in fact acquire Simon & Schuster. It has to be approved first, but they're going to have 
an enormous share of titles in the U.S. market. They could launch their own ebook subscription service, and I can't imagine why they wouldn't, unless they feel like it would really anger the independent bookstore community and it's not worth it. But there's such a tiny percentage of the market. I don't think they would care what Amazon thought. Although I guess Amazon, of course, could really express its anger in many different ways. Um, but Amazon's also under great scrutiny for already, you know, being too big. So I'm just, yeah, I think I think it could happen. I mean, some publishers who are in niche markets already do that, like O'Reilly in the tech market. Um, there's some romance publishers that are doing it, uh, children's publishers as well. There's Epic. Um, so yeah, I think, it, yeah, I, I think it feels inevitable. And if they, yeah. they have to be having those conversations. Yeah, so this is some more turmoil to come. Uh, in the future hopefully it just benefits people writing creating the content because it's got to go got to come from somewhere there'll be more opportunities yes. um and in terms of the indie side of things jane you feeling i think you think you said you feel quite enthusiastic about the indie side of, of publishing you feeling optimistic for writers as long as they're not too naive about their expectations <laughs> yeah I, I know that you know people feel like it's crowded um, I think there's maybe some frustration that you have to advertise now to keep the visibility, but that applies to everyone. Traditional publishers, I feel like, are in the same boat. Um, so I know there's a bit of a learning curve there, but for those writers who can, who, who know their genre, know how to package and position, I think it's very exciting. And there are also other digital st storytelling platforms that, I'm also interested in just from like a publishing nerd perspective, like we've got Kindle Vela that's coming, yeah. which I'm, I'm interested to see how that plays out and how it competes against all of the eight more Asia based online literature platforms. Um, so the chat based storytelling and the more gamified storytelling, I'm wondering if that's going to really stick like with the young people who are experiencing that now, are they going to want to see it? Um, keep engaging with it will that change how publishers publish i don't i think these are really interesting questions yeah they really are it seems very zeitgeist doesn't it that whole movement vela being amazon's grasp yeah. of it but um it's a bit like fits into to the way you operate i think jane you're saying you prefer those short bursts of uh <laughs> of do. content so there you go you're very zeitgeist aren't you um <laughs> great how can people find you jane particularly that newsletter people might want to be uh take advantage of yeah, it's called The Hot Sheet, and you can find it at hotsheetpub.com. There's a free trial. And then if you can't remember the name of that newsletter, you can find it mentioned at my my uh, my author website, which is janefriedman.com. And you, you speak, uh, obviously, we're in a digital um, sort of conference era at the moment. When we come out of uh, the pandemic, will you be at live conferences or people get an opportunity to see you speak? Yeah. In fact, yesterday, I just got my first invitation to speak at a 2022 conference right. in wow. person. So it feels like, like for me, that's like one of the biggest signs of a return to, to normal, whatever that might mean, um, to actually have an in-person event approach me. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah. Great. So people can look out for you there. Well, Jane, thank you very much for keeping us all informed. Um, you're one of the, I think probably one of the first book Twitter accounts I followed. So that seems to work. Oh, thank you. And uh, you're definitely a voice in our industry. We appreciate uh, the work you do. So thank you very much indeed uh, for coming onto the show as well. My pleasure. Thank you, James. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Can you believe it? My lawnmower started now. My gardener's turned up. Your your leaf blower was on at the beginning of the interview. Now my gardener's turning up. Um, well, our, our many staff. Middle class. There <laughs> yeah. we go. Middle class problems. Goodness I, sake, Jeeves. I, I'm slightly worried now because the puppy has left several puppy presents on the uh, <laughs> lawn, which I feel bad about. I always try and pick up before Paul gets here. Paul, Paul Young is my gardener. Well, wherever he leaves his hat. Everyone does that. Okay, that's Jane Friedman. I know you've been um, following Jane for a while, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I've been on. I was on a, a webinar with Jane and a few others a long time ago. So yes, I have. Um, I've been following Jane for a while. It's the hot sheet is her um, her newsletter, which is well worth subscribing to. It's um, very detailed. Goes out every week, um, and usually lots of interesting stuff there. And as you say, she's she's agnostic about how things are published. It's just about Ooh. you know different ways of getting books to readers really which yeah. is the right way to look at it 
absolutely is what it is good okay look thank you very much indeed uh mark thank you to our guest jane this week don't forget you can support the podcast at patreon.com and you get lots of goodies to go along with that uh patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show i should say and i think that's probably it mark i think that probably is as uh, i can't hear i don't know if your lawnmower's going my leaf blower has stopped so uh, i'm gonna go and uh and take another antihistamine tablet, and then I might go and uh, as and play some golf. I think that's, that's what I because might do that's, today. Because that's good for hay fever. Well, I'm thinking golf. it's at least those will be well manicured lawns with hopefully not, less. Not where your ball lands. No, that's that's very Did true. Yes, yeah. very good. Yes, you're fine. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we're going to play again soon, aren't we? I think. Yeah. It should be exciting. Good. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And it's a sneezy goodbye for me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show. <laughs>